listening to chiefs, who went to another place listening to artisans, farmers, miners, Okada riders, uh, market women. Today we are at the great hall of the KNUST. I was about to say University of Ghana because I... <laughs> <laughs> you know the reason, but I'm not going to talk about it because I'm on, I'm on very hostile grounds. So, <laughs> so I should watch my statements. <laughs> so we are here and um, gathered here are leaders of labor movements principally and so we are engaging the labor movement of Ghana to listen to them what their expectations are for the next uh, five years well the, the, this last year we cannot be accountable to whatever happens but the four years from <laughs> Uh, 2025 January to um, 2029 January. So this is not a political, a partisan political gathering. We did not select the invitees based on their political colors. We selected them based on their vocation. And so we want to listen to you as honestly as possible to tell us what you find wrong with your current situation and how you want to see yourselves by the end of the uh, 2028 and your suggestions as to how we can take you there or we can move towards there together because our motto for the next election is building the Ghana we want together. We as politicians cannot build the country alone and we believe that if you are also building the country you need our guidance or cooperation. So we think that we are all coming together to build the Ghana we want. And so today we are beginning with the initial steps, and that is listening to you about your vision for the country in the next um, four to five years. So we will proceed like this. After my presentation, maybe our host may give us some remarks, and then we get back onto the program. And then the an officer will be here and will be recognizing uh, leadership of the unions or members of the unions to share with us their ideas as to how we can make things better so that we can build the Ghana we all want together. Thank you very much and you may wish to clap for me if you think I've made some sense. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause for the only general in Ghana politics. It's always a learning experience listening to him. Now we will move straight into action. Like we said, this is going to be a dialogue section between the various labor unions and His Excellency. So without my time, without waste, wasting my time, you will be inviting Without wasting my time, we will be inviting representatives of the various labor unions to come and give us uh, uh, their concerns, suggestions, their ideas, and what have you. But this is how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be very brief, concise, and straight to the point. We have 13 labor unions here present, but not all of them, unfortunately, will have the opportunity to uh, come up here and ask their questions. Hopefully there will be another section where the 
other unions that do not get the opportunity today will have the opportunity to brainstorm with the president. Please, so please do bear with us. Without wasting much time, we will invite onto the podium the representative of the University Teachers Association of Ghana, KNUSC chapter, their president, Professor Eric K. K. Agbavari, to come up and share his ideas with the president. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I don't know whether the protocol has already been set. If it is set, then thank you very much. I stand on all protocols. I'm really surprised because I'm going to give a talk. And so and I wasn't told to do so. But now that I'm asked to do that, then I'm going to speak from my head. And what I'm going to say is what it is. And if it will be taken seriously, then we will make him progress. Um, I don't want to bore you with this story, which I know everybody here does. The power of a country lies on the manpower of its members. That is intellectual power. If the intellectual power is compromised, what it means is that that country future is equally compromised. I saw a flyer some time back and that was a flyer in South Africa, a certain university. And on that flyer, it describes how nations are destroyed. And I'm sure many here have seen that flyer before. So if you want to destroy a nation, destroy the intellectual power, poison them, and they will poison the younger generation, and the younger generation, they get poisoned, then everybody becomes poisoned. And I think we don't want Ghana children to be poisoned. I stand here as a unionist, and I represent my members, and whatever I say, I say it, that's what they are thinking. For me, it's about my take home as a union man. It's about my take home and nothing more. I want to be compensated according to what I do. I understand our country is not rich and therefore I'm not expected to be paid like a colleague that is elsewhere that you know. But at least I want to be compensated in a manner that in the morning I'll look in the face of my kid and say, child, it is good you are born here. If I look in the face of my kid, I'm able to say, kid, it's good you are born a Ghanaian. Then I have failed the kid and Ghana has also failed me because my take home is not take home. Will you believe that a newly appointed lecturer take home is less than 5,000 Ghana city? And what is the percentage of that in terms of dollar? If I take my exchange rate to be 12, is to $1, and I take 4,000, then your arithmetic is as good as mine. A lecturer takes that much, and we know how much it costs to pay for a school fees and a rent. I do not want to bore you, but let's see this. I feel sad. I feel sad because throughout my adult life, I have not for once heard Ghana say, this country is rich. We always say we don't have money. I've worked for here in this university for 20 years. No time that this country had ever said they have enough money to pay workers. 
I don't want to be political because I am not. Because I speak the language of union. We had a salary structure called single spine. Single spine was brought with intention to make workers better off. Before this single spine was brought, UTAG members were receiving a certain allowance called professional allowance. And when they brought the single spine, I wouldn't want to say we were deceived to be roped onto the single spine. So this professional allowance that was being given to us, we were told when we get to single spine, it will even become better. And so they renamed it and called it a certain name called market premium. When they put us there on this market premium thing, members were excited. But excitement was short-lived. Just two years, I do not know what happened. A certain document called White Paper was written, and was written by my president, because he signed it, and so therefore it is in his name. When it was signed, it temporarily put a hold on this professional allowance of UTAG members since 2012. But the intention was good, was to allow some exercise called labor market survey should be conducted. And when it is conducted, they will then determine the professional allowance, which is the now the interim market premium, to become better. So they froze it. They froze it. 2013. This monster called white paper also indicated that this labor market should be carried out by fair wages. In 2014, the labor market surveys was actually done. But the determination of the premium never saw the light of the day. They still held on to the absolute figure of the white paper. 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, another monster white um, market survey was again done. And we we're expecting that market premium will be determined, ladies and gentlemen, as we speak. The market premium is still not determined. And the professional allowance that they were taking in 27, uh, before 2010, it tastes the same. At that time, please, at that time, the lecturer whose pay is now four th less than 5000 was taking $1,500 CD equivalent. I was expecting that I should grow up, but not to grow down. And so all things being equal, I must at least, if I don't get anything, at least, the thousand five hundred dollar should be paid to the poor lecturer. It's not. Let me give an interesting story. Just two or three years ago, a colleague in Zimbabwe wanted to come and do a kind of postdoctorate work here. He applied, and when the university responded and saw the remuneration. He refused it. He said, even in Zimbabwe, as a senior lecturer, I take $1,700. So why give him something even less than $1,000? What I want to send home now is this. For us, we want the single the, that entire single spine structure should be scrapped. 
as one way. If they cannot strap it, then the number of levels that on our spine should be what? in front of students in the lecture room so sometimes the the, the commentary goes a bit uh, lengthy as is supposed but we thank you very much prof but this is how we are going to proceed we are far behind schedule and uh, all other speakers are going to be timed that is why we say the contributions and everything are supposed to be concise straightforward so that uh, our recorders can take appropriate notice. The next group to have the opportunity to put their ideas across is the Tertiary Education Workers Union local chapter, represented by Chairman Charles Arthur. Three minutes, strictly. Thank you very much. Um, Vice Chancellor Professor Mrs. Rita Kosio Adixin and former Vice Chancellor Professor Kosio Bridanso and Registrar Mr. Kosi Boateng. Your Excellency, former President, for us in tertiary education, Workers Union of Ghana, we, our suggestion is very simple that what we are witnessing now in the various universities is that we have people somewhere who have no knowledge or little knowledge in running of the universities negotiating our conditions of service. It used to be that we have committee of vice chancellors. A lot of people do not know. And unfortunately, committee of vice chancellors has also sat down for politicians to um, put their nose or whatever it is in the running of the university and a lot of things are happening, strike, etc. When we say committee of vice chancellors, it comprises of a vice chancellor of the university who is a professor and a, a, a lecturer, a pro vice chancellor who is a lecturer, a registrar who is a chief administrator who is in charge of policies of the university, a finance officer who is also in charge of financial matters of the university. These are the composition of committee of vice chancellors, and these are the people that we were negotiating our conditions of service with them. And that time you will hear, you will see, there's no confusion. I think during, before, during President, uh, former President um, J.J. Rowling's time, the, the revolution time, that was the situation. Committee of Vice Chancellors Chairman, together with the entire Committee of Vice Chancellors, with the unions, because they understand. They are running the universities, so they understand what is going on. So, um, if you, uh, you are a junior leader, you bring something which is un unreasonable, a vice chancellor can tell you that, look, I am here. This is unreasonable. I will not accept it. When we have finished everything, it goes to the government, then the government side will look at it, approve, finish. There is no strike. Former President, as we speak here, in G here, Gawa, Ghana Association of University Administrators, 29th, Monday, we are going. I'm a member. We are going on strike. <laughs> yes. Yes. Number two, tertiary education workers, we are also going, uh, uh, what do you call it? First February. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
So why, 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 why is it that it's happening this way? If you allow vice chancellors to do the negotiation, you will reduce to the barest minimum strike in the various universities. And former vice chancellor, you are a former uh, president. You agree with me, and everybody here will agree with me that a government, your human resource that you use to run your government and for that matter for the country, you get it from the university. I was so happy that chairman said he's come from the University of Ghana. Former vice, uh, yourself, Banda, <laughs> Joyce Moktal herself, over there, you understand? All of us. So how can you treat the university the way you are treating the university? Yes, sir. So to remove, reduce to the barest minimum of non-existence, allow, I want you to put it in your manifesto that I, John Dramani Mama, the President of the Republic of Ghana, I'm saying that I will give VC the, to, do, to do their own thing. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for Chairman Arthur. The next group to put their views across as members of the Ghana Bar Association, represented by Ivan Samankwa Esquire. Good. A round of applause for lawyer Evans Amankwa. Your Excellency, I will stand on the existing protocol. My question is very simple. The Ghana Bar Association, there is a notion that when NDC is in power, the Bar Association doesn't speak. Then, uh, when NDC is in power, the Bar Association speaks. But when the MPP is in power, the Ghana Bar Association doesn't speak. And that is something that is so worrying to the Bar Association. Because we are of the humble opinion that as an association, we belong to the country. And for that matter, for NDC to create the impression that the Bar Association is political, is somehow unfortunate. would want to ask the incoming president of the Republic of Ghana, which I know. Which I know, by God's grace, is going to manifest in 2025, 7 January. When, by God's grace, he ascends the throne as the president of this republic, what steps is he going to take so that there will be cordiality between the Ghana Bar Association and the NDC as a government? Then the Bar Association will have that kind of conducive atmosphere to be able to relate to the NDC government in a way that everybody will be happy, members of the Bar Association will be happy. That is my question to the President. The next group to address this gathering or to put their views across, they call themselves the mother of all teacher unions in Ghana, the Ghana National Association of Teachers, represented by the Ashanti Regional uh, Deputy Ashanti Regional Secretary, Mr. Eric Adongo. Time 
for the Ghana National Association of Teachers to put their views across. Thank you very much. Standing on the existing protocol, I want to say, coming from the teacher's side, it is a fact that the country is hot, but we at the teaching front, I don't know the words to use. It is very stressful, and we have a number of issues we want to put across. One has to do with our pensions. When it was started, the new pension tier was instituted. We were of the opinion that we should be given the opportunity to manage it. But then I remember Honorable Harun Idrisu was a Labour minister or so. It went to court and it ended up that we should put the money in the suspend accounts of uh, Bank of Ghana. That money has been forced and turned into bonds that our members have retired and they come to us in their offices, they can't get their money. Already when they were working, they were not getting enough. Now they are retired and their monies are locked up. We are forced to take bonds. If we willingly go to the bond market to take money, that is a risk I'm taking as a person. But where my money is in a place because of confusion, and later on you are forcing converting it into a bond, and now pay the bond because the retirees are due to take the money, and it is a problem. Look, if you are young, you can withstand a lot of stress, but when you are old, you need your money, you need medication. A country that doesn't recognize its old citizens is not worth dying for. So what are you coming to do for us, teachers, in terms of accommodation, in terms of our condition of service? You go to the rural areas, you have schools there, there's no clinic, there is no accommodation, and teachers are refusing postings there. And day in, day out, at my office, I have to deal with directors to plead. Please, we are pleading, appealing to the uh, next government, if you are voted into power, we pray that you don't do dotted projects. If you are coming to construct a school, it should come with a clinic, it should come with a lot of facilities that it can serve as a community and people can go there and comfortably live. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Adongo. It is now the turn of the Ghana Medical Association, and the one to speak on behalf of them is Dr. Pa Kwesi. Let's give him a round of applause. Yeah, thank you very much. I stand on existing protocols. We are with the health sector, so my issues will be on health. Even though we agree with what our colleagues, um, teachers, um, talked about, it's affecting all of us. So, Mr. President, um, if I may say so, we of the Ghana Medical Association, we are interested in your policies in terms of the health sector when you become the president. Again, we noticed, especially in the Ashanti region, the number of uncompleted or abandoned projects. In fact, we have the Afari Military Hospital, the Sewa Hospital. This is placing so much stress on the existing facilities, especially the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. And it's not only affecting the workers there, it's affecting the investee. And as I'm saying, I'm sure the VC will be aware, though I, I do part-time for them, for the medical school, and probably I may be terminated, probably. But the current first-year clinical students, 450 of them, and I'm sure when they were being admitted three, four years ago, they had in mind that by the time they get to the clinical years, these facilities will be completed. Now we have something we call the agenda. Initially it was 88. 
now 111 and it was to be completed it was to be completed in a year but then in the video is there I issued a statement that if even they are able to complete one or two in two years I will resign as a labor unionist how many years do we have so I want to find out as a president are you going to toe that same line abandoning projects um, initiated by your predecessors that's the first one the second one is on brain drain you see a lot of health workers are migrating and somebody like me I've always said is good for if not for the country for their families it's good for their families in that most of our health workers especially the nurses retire and in no time they are dead you know why because they cannot even afford the very services they were providing when they were in active service so why shouldn't they go seeking um, better conditions what policies will you put in place to make sure this is um, stemmed I remember during your um, tenor that time we were house officers we had a policy the vehicle waivers and all that and which most of us enjoyed but in 2012 it was terminated we're trying to initiate it not only for doctors but for health workers and it is our hope that this will be reintroduced and guided we also want to talk about the issue of Galamse and its attendant um, health policies Galamse has become more of a political gala but that is not for us as doctors because we see the effects I am an orthopedic surgeon I deal with deformities and all that and we are seeing the deformities and most of these if I may be corrected most of the active players in the Galamse sector are people who have political backings but then is the populace the unfortunate person in my village who is bearing the blunt of it so what will be your policies is it going to be another lift service just like we've seen and these are what we want to the last one without taking much of your time is the NHIS most of our facilities are collapsing and they are collapsing because of finances the NHIS I think whatever is guarded goes straight into the consolidated fund I stand to be corrected again we believe and this is a proposal that instead of that going to the levies going into the consolidated fund and the consolidated fund I'm sure um, we can use it for so many things I stand to be corrected but here we believe that it should be referenced so that it goes solely towards the purpose for which it is intended that is health financing and this we believe will make our health services better so that we can all enjoy that service here thank you very much the next group to have the opportunity to put their views across is the Coalition of Concerned Teachers Association of Ghana, represented by the Ash Ashanti Regional Vice Chairman, Mr. Richard Asumadu. Let's give him a round of applause, Mr. Richard Asumadu. Thank you. Your Excellency, I crave your indulgence to stand on the existing uh, protocols. My name is Richard Uswasumudu. I am a teacher. I love teaching. But I don't like being a teacher. And I repeat, I don't like being a teacher. I school to become a mechanical engineer. And for whatever reason, I landed in the teaching service. my students or my past students will uh, affirm that I do my job diligently because I love it 
but I said I do not like being a teacher again. Uh, borrowing what my earlier speakers have said, especially those in the education fraternity, teachers are living offshore to look for greener pastures. Why? And the next few months, I will be having a discussion with my son about the profession he would like to enter when he grows up. I want to passionately tell him that, or suggest to him that he should be a teacher. I don't love it. I mean, I love it, but I don't like being it. But how would I have the moral switch, the moral encouragement to tell him that? So my question is, if I'm in right now and I don't like it, and my colleagues are living, what would you do to make me suggest to him that he should be a teacher? My union has a lands and housing policy. And we brought this policy into being when, after a research, we realized that teachers go to the banks, borrow for an uh, amount that they are, would pay in two or three years. But as they take the money, they go and give it to a landlord. And the maximum period that that money can last them, usually, is less than the period that they are going to use to pay the loan. So most of the time, as they are servicing the loan, they also have to find means to pay for three to six months extension before they can go in for another sum. My union, the policy was to build the houses for we, the members. But unfortunately, we are not having investors. Those who come usually say that the amount that they would like to deduct every month when we compare to our affordability, our affordability usually is like 60-70% of the amount. And as I speak right now, most of our members have purchased their plots of lands, but they are lying idle. Some have even started selling them. And again, I would like to suggest to my son that he should be a teacher. So please, when you are blessed with the powers of the people. Do something for us. Thank you. A very passionate plea put across on behalf of teachers by the Vice Chairman of Consent Teachers Union. Let's give a round of applause for him again. I never knew we had two Tewus, like I said earlier. The local chapter of Tewu have addressed us. And I'm seeing another Tewu, Tewu of TUC. And their representative is Tewu of TUC. And yours is Tewu Ghana. Oh, okay, there is Tewu Ghana and Tewu of TUC. Okay. So Tewu of TUC will be represented by Mr. Benedict Lamte, the local vice chairman. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. My former president, my vice chancellor, and my colleagues. This is Teachers and Educational Workers Union of TUC, the mother union. Mr. President, or my former president, I want to start with the general view, the end of the union matter. On my side, when I look at the economy, if economy is human being, I'm seeing that it has, he has started putting his head down. And if he doesn't have somebody to hold him up, very soon you will see that the head will be down and the leg will go up.
Because we all know what is in the system now and what is going on. We are in this country, Ghana, and we got in here that yet is a common deal. So I'm asking, as my former president, you are coming back. Oh, Baba, Transica, no, so now it's a common deal, now we're sorry for you. Now what I know, I know. And she dream who my answer. So I'll be able to transfer there. And they have a strike. Then before the single spine, workers are receiving risk allowance. When the single spine take off, now the risk allowance is nowhere to be found. And we are worse off. Based on the nature of our works. You will be injured. And when you get injury, it is between you and God. So I want to know, if you come back, this is our risk allowance. What are you going to do about it? If you are going to help us to receive it, then thank God. But if not, strike there, you will that. You will strike Because that is the only language that when you are at the top there, you hear. When we are on strike, you answer. If you didn't go on strike, you, you don't answer us. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Benedict Lamte. Who, it's now the turn of the Technical University Teachers Association, Technical University Teachers Union, and they are views and suggestions will be put across by the Ashanti Regional Chairman, Dr. Bismarck Parker. Let's give a round of applause to Dr. Bismarck Parker, Ashanti Regional Chairman of TUTAG. Thank you very much. So, I, Chair, I stand on the existing protocols and wish to continue some way, somehow, from where my very colleague, Prof. Agbavari, ended. Um, President, the technical universities were established with very specific mandates. And I think the whole initiative and then the establishment started and ended somehow during your tenure. Unfortunately, the establishment did not come with resourcing. So, there were no resources provided for the TUs to be able to carry on that mandate that they were granted. And therefore, it has affected the full functioning of the TUs. So, it is our plea or request that we will be grateful to know from you how you seek to create sufficient funding to help the TUs undertake their various mandates. The next on our list has to do with the somehow dollarization of our um, economy to the extent that as we speak the earnings of the average lecturer has almost eroded. And I think that, for us, is one of the reasons why we always continue to agitate. And I think this affects all Ghanaian workers. If our managers of our economy will really think about the earnings of workers by putting in mechanisms that will ensure that we stabilize the exchange rate, I believe that demands of workers will reduce and government will have sufficient room to function. Because as the difference in our earnings present and the future is eroded by increase in the dollar rate, then certainly you should expect that we are going to agitate. And it is not the fault of the worker, because whatever you get really is not enough for anything. 
So we ask that we pay attention to this very specific issue as well. As a university, all the TUs, we have a very difficult issue, which has to do with enrollment. Um, we all understand that by the design of our country, we believe in theoretical or grammar education. And so most people are not actually interested in undertaking technical education. Even though we all have to, we have come to understand that is the path that we have to go. Unfortunately, you will have, for instance, if I have to just make a quick comparison, um, education or admissions for this spe uh, specific year in most of the TUs, it's low. But if you compare that to um, the other universities, you would see a very vast difference. The question is, how are we going to put in place mechanisms to ensure that people take the admissions or look at the TUs as places where they can really make hands-on or gain the hands-on experience, which actually we need to drive this economy. We need to pay attention to, to this as well, Mr. President. We want to ask, we have created technical education. Have we given them any mandates or tax for product development? which government is expecting to use within the economy. So the products or the uh, research or the activities that these TUs undertake, whatever product that they develop, who is interested in using these products to propel growth in the economy and also generate some cash inflow that would help the TUs to continue producing these products. We believe that it is relevant to put these things in the manifesto to help the, the growth of our economy. I want to touch on one concern. It's vehicle waiver. We believe that we are very critical staff. Unfortunately, our earnings aren't that much to buy the vehicles that really we also would prefer because of the high cost. We also are interested in benefiting from the vehicle waiver. And we believe that um, we'll be grateful if that is also considered for the technical university teacher. President, there is a policy now in the country where IGF, for instance, is used in paying electricity bills. As we speak, there is even a VAT also slapped on it. The cost is always rising. And I'm going to link this to the fees. Already, the enrollment is low. If you are going to generate enough to pay the electricity bill and other bills expected to be paid using IGF, then it means that you have to levy that student. And if the fee is high, already the interest is low. Technically, we are telling Ghanaians that we will speak about technical education, but we will not do whatever will encourage them to take on that offer. And I think it's something we have to really pay attention to. We should make the technical education very attractive so that the Ghanaians will take on. I want to end by saying that during your tenure, you launched a campus for Kumase Technical University at Piansi. Nothing has happened since then. And we would be very grateful to know how you intend to help us grow that particular uh, campus to the expected level. Maybe last point. Last point. We're looking at uni uh, hospitals for the technical universities. We have many clinics, mostly. But as universities that are providing very um, hands-on skill to, uh, to students, some are running uh, pharmaceutical sciences, and 
they do not have those laboratories and very much hospitals also to aid in the, the nature of training that they are getting. We want you to also put that in, or take it into consideration and we'll be very grateful to see in your manifesto how you intend to help drive that cause. Thank you very much. We will take two more uh, presentations and then we will take the address of His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. There are about three labor unions whose presentation unfortunately we can't take today we will take two more presentations like i said so without wasting my time we will invite the rep from nagrat national association of graduate students the ashanti regional secretary Atendana Baba Joseph. A round of applause for him. Respectfully, uh, I wish to stand on the already established protocol. And I start my questioning with a quote from um, Suzy Obanzi is dead. It's a book written by Atul Fuga. And he says, How can I not afford to die in an hospital I work in? My president, how can the teacher not be able to afford the education? of his word in the tertiary institution. We want to recommend as a way to uplift, arrest, curtail the mass exodus of teachers. You grant at least two words of a teacher who has taught not less than 10 years at the university. Then, my next question is on this issue of free SHS. Are you going to review it? Are you going to cancel it? What are you going to do to ensure that what is already in existence is improved tremendously? Again, the curricula and time spent by our students in the senior high. Our students come, spend, spend a month in school and go home to spend three months. And that student comes back and is supposed to continue. These are the things with and also, we want to know what we do about allowances to the teacher. Either they are not paid, they are paid erratically, or sometimes nothing is said about them at all. Thank you. Please don't go. Please don't go. Since you are in the teaching field, in the business of teaching SHS students, what would you want done with the free education? That is what we are here for. What you want done. Do you want it cancelled, improved, or reviewed? <laughs> yes. I will take the bull by the horn. I would want it improved, not cancelled. Thank you very much. That is what we are here for. We are here for solutions. We are here for suggestions that will improve whatever sector that we find ourselves. We have a representative of Charles here. I hope you know Charles. Conference of Assisted Headmasters. 
But if the problem is if we allow him to come here, the next morning you see in front of one of the national dailies that GES suspends a headmaster of an institution. Since we don't want that to happen, we would reluctantly deny the opportunity to the uh, child's representative. The last to do the presentation is the senior staff for association of our universities. Senior staff association of our universities. A round of applause. Uh, <coughs> Thank you. I stand on the existing protocols. And I'll start by asking a question. I hope most of you here, when we were relatively younger, we were told to have a saving culture. That whatever you get, you should try and save little for the future. But the question now is, when you look into our country nowadays, does it worth saving your money? Of course, no. Whatever little amount you put with a bank, after a few days you go, because of inflation, it has no value again. And this has gone on to affect, even with our tier 2 pension, now most of our unions are on strike because some amount that ought to, be, to have been paid since 2010, they are still with the government. Meanwhile, others are going on retirement at that age. What extra work can that old person do to survive? Yes, Excellency, my question is, this tier two issue started when you were the president of Ghana, and the question is, why couldn't you do the needful then for it to have gotten to this stage? Because others are saying, when we were invited, because we don't want to come and save things on our own, we place the invitation on our platform for people to suggest. And they were saying that after the politicians, leave them. But we know for sure without you, the country can also not be governed. Is it a typical situation where you want to tell us when the situation arises, tell them something so that they will just know they are ahead and go ahead with it? So please, for the tier two and our old age, something must. Because for now, maybe you may go around it in a softer way. You can never tell. Most people are so much depressed about what is going on. The suggestion is that you are, because initially we are having the uh, snit, and you said that, oh, putting all your eggs in one basket, something may happen to it. You being the government, you are the one in charge of the finance. You know where the money is coming from. So you manage the economy. You know the money where it is. So my suggestion is, whenever the money is due for payment, please pay so that the fund managers will be able to work with it at the end of the day, we'll be able to get something for our old folks who are going on retirement. Thank you. Unfortunately, this is all time will allow. There are other associations that time would not permit us to have their presentation. However, we will do them the honors of acknowledging them. We have the Tain Patrons Association of the Ashanti Region. Please, if you are here, let's see you by hand. Represented by Professor Brenya. We have the 10 presidents in Ashanti region. If you are here, let's see you by hand. 10 presidents. Clap for yourselves. Clap for yourselves.
Then we have the election integrity monitors. Their chairman, Asim Dake. Unfortunately, we cannot take your presentation today, but hopefully there would be some other time where we will take whatever you have, or we can put whatever suggestions, views, or ideas we have for His Excellency in written form and submit it to the appropriate quarters. Like I said, this was not supposed to, this is not a question and answer section. This is a dialogue section in which organized labor was supposed to give their views, suggestions, feedbacks on some of the uh, policy proposals in the People's Manifesto 2020. So in, press, in the former president's address, it's very likely you may not hear an answer to your question. Be as it may, whatever, whatever views and suggestions, please, whatever views and suggestions that has been made here has been written down by the scribes of His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. These views will be ag aggregated and possibly find its way into the People's Manifesto. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the moment we've all been waiting for. The man who has been destined to come save Ghana from the economic morass that the present government has put us in. The man who will be sworn in as the president of the Republic of Ghana come 7 January. Ladies and gentlemen, with a huge round of applause and a standing ovation, let's welcome His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be very brief, even though um, we've had a lot of contributions, we've listened to a lot of contributions. Um, I just want to begin by thanking our host, uh, Madam Vice-Chancellor, and our Registrar for allowing us to have this session at such short notice. We just give them two days notice and they've been very magnanimous to give us this hall to hold this event. And um, they've also taken time off, left what they're doing to come to join us to be part of this event. I want to thank you very much. I want to thank all the unions and all the representatives who have spoken. I thank you very much for the views that you have uh, presented. As General said, the purpose was not a Q&A uh, event. It was an event to listen to you and find out what solutions you have to some of those things that you think are the challenges that you're facing. In some of the contributions, um, some suggestions came up. In others, it's Aluta Continua, but uh, <laughs> I've, been, I've been in that spot before, and so I can understand, you know, uh, your, your feelings. Um, of course, there were challenges when I was president, and there were challenges, there's always been challenges. That's what governance is about, and that's what countries are about. There were challenges in Rawlings' time. He handed them over to President Kufour. President Kufour solved some of those challenges. New challenges arose. He handed them over to Professor Mills. Professor Mills solved some of the challenges. New ones arose, handed over to me. I did my best, solved some of the challenges. New challenges arose. I handed them over to Nana Kufuado. It's been it. He's been, in, he's been in office for eight years. So if you are raising the same challenges and saying that, oh, this started in your time, then I've, I wonder what we've spent the last eight years doing. But let's, let's leave it there. Let's cut out the politics. But I do think that the issues you've raised are important. What I want to say is that in a country, you create and then you share. And so a country cannot share 
what has not been created. As the economy grows and the economy gets better and there's more money available, everybody will get a bigger share of that money. And so I appreciate that we say Zimbabwe, somebody was paid this, this, somebody was paid that. But it depends on at what levels our nations are and how we are managing our economy. And that's why I say the first duty for any government is economic stability. When I was leaving office in 2016, the dollar to the CD was four, four CDs. I don't know what your take home pay was at that time, but probably if you compared it and the dollar had remained stable, if today the dollar was around six and you are taking the salary you are taking, you probably would find that you are earning more than you have. And that's why when the representative from uh, Technical University raised the issue of the dollar and the CD, it is at the crux of what is happening. We are in an economic crisis. And the other time in Ho, I said something that people misunderstood because I said that the economy is in crisis and we might come to meet after this government have, le have left, we might find out that the situation is worse than we have even been told. And so I said, we must all prepare to make sacrifices. I said, we will reduce government expenditure. We would reduce the expenditure of the office of the president. We will reduce the number of, the, of ministers. We will reduce the number of ministries. Agencies... <laughs> agencies that are duplicating each other will be merged. Those are the words I, I said. And so I said that we must all be prepared to sacrifice. I will sacrifice myself. The, the, the annoying thing is when you are sacrificing and somebody else is loosening his belt, then you know there's a problem. And so all of us will, and I said that we will hold a century like forum. Everybody will attend. We will show you the economic figures, show you what the economy has so that we all understand. We did it before. Same thing, we called everybody. We showed all of you the figures. And I sat in negotiations with, uh, uh, with the unions to set the minimum wage and agree the salary for the following year. And all of us would see the figures in real time and know what is available. And so I've heard you say reintroduce RICS allowance, um, uh, uh, market premiums, uh, so on and so on and so forth. But it will all depend on what is there in the coffers. And one of the points I've made is that a lot of you are angry because we have two sets of people, public workers in this country. We have Article 71 public workers and we have fair wages public workers. And that is uh, fair wages, yeah, public workers. And that is part of the problem. And so our solution is that let's form an independent emoluments commission that will take from the president, who is the highest public servant, to the ordinary laborer and put all of us on the spine wherever we deserve to be. And so several times I've called for the support of organized labor to agitate so that we remove Article 71. We should all, all, our, all our emoluments should be determined together. Because if the president too is on the same spine with everybody else, he will work to grow the economy so that his salary too can go up. And so let us agree, let's take Article 71 uh, emoluments out. It says a special committee shall determine the emoluments of the following category of people. And so that committee determines how much they should earn. Everybody else, you have to go to fair wages uh, or negotiate with government negotiating team or tripartite committee to be able to set your salaries. But if we're all on the same spine and we all have our salaries determined, you know, in the same way that is negotiated, all of us will know that this is what is available and we will be satisfied with what we are giving and we will work even harder in order that we create more so that we can share more. But let me just take a few of the things you said. We've listened and um, we have a lady, um, one of our young sisters, recording everything that you said. So everything you said has been recorded. Beatrice, stand up. Yeah, she's got her laptop and everything you said has been recorded there. 
I might not have all the solutions to the issues you raised uh, here, but I'll just comment on a few of them. Um, the issue of the pensions, we'll look at it. Pension reform was done from Professor Mills' time, and it continued sometime into my time. And we thought that the Tier 2 was going to come to provide a better uh, pension uh, uh, resource to uh, workers who have retired. Unfortunately, I can see that the bottleneck is the release of the money from the state funds to the fund managers. And so we must see how we can resolve that so that the fund managers get the money on time, they invest the funds, and then the funds are available when people go on retirement. In some cases, and I was asking the, one of the, those who spoke, he said that their funds had been converted to bonds, and the bonds had been part of the debt restructuring. I thought pensions were not, part, were not included, but I've been told that been, uh, those that were bonds have been included in the debt restructuring. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Some of us saw the red signs, the red flag, we raised it because in 2019 I said that we are not being given the true figures of the economy. The finance minister is engaged in creative accounting because he was giving a deficit figure that was showing brighter economy than the economy actually was. All of us knew that there was a hole in the economy because he was not adding the ESLA debt. But what is ESLA? ESLA is a creature of government. Any liability that ESLA incurs is a government liability. He was not including the uh, energy sector debt. And up to now, the energy sector debt, he hasn't included it. That's $1.5 billion. And that's the single biggest risk to this economy today. Even after the debt restructuring, if something gives and the $1.5 uh, billion, $1 billion becomes due, and it's becoming due already, that's why we're seeing lights off. Because Sunan Asogli will threaten to shut off, he will rush and go and give them $20 million. This one will threaten to shut off, he will go and work, West African Gas Pipeline will threaten to shut off, he will go and give them a little money. Firefighting. And I said he's firefighting to push it across the 2025 line and hand it over to President Mahama to deal with. You know. He, he, he was ill advised and did the banking sector clean out. And my, my friend, Dr. Dufo, is here. His bank was shut. You said they should increase their uh, uh, reserve requirements by 400 million. And that if they don't uh, increase it by a certain time, you shut them down. And so you shut down nine banks, or is it ten banks? Because if you even add 400 million, if they required 400 million, and you added 400 million times ten banks, that's 4 billion CDs. But let's say they had liquidity problems. And so you, if you added their liquidity problems, you're talking about 9 billion CDs, 7 or 9 billion CDs. But what government doesn't tell us is that there is a reverse side of it. A lot of that money that government said they were having problems with liquidity was money that government owed to contractors who are taking loans from their banks. And so if government too paid the contractors and the contractors paid the banks, the banks will not be in trouble. And yet, ill-advisedly, they shut them down and turned an issue that was a 7 billion CD problem into a 25 billion CD debt. Because they guaranteed the deposits of everybody who had deposits in those banks. And any time he did the budget, he put the banking sector clean out as an appendix without adding it into his calculation. So he'll come and tell you uh, this year the deficit was 5%. We did very well, 5% deficit. And the uh, painful thing is the international community was also clapping for him and giving him more money. And he wanted a lower deficit figure and a, bright, a brighter outlook of the economy in order that he could go and borrow more. In six years, the man borrowed $13.5 billion from the euro bond market. And that's why we are where we are today. And so, it is important for labor not to just look at the narrow angle of your own emoluments and your conditions of living, but to look at the responsibility of politicians so that tomorrow we don't end in this hole where we all are suffering today. Today, inflation is up at 30 something percent. It went to 50 something percent. All of us go to that same market. 
And yet when this thing was developing and we were talking about it, people thought, oh, uh, NDC as usual, they're always complaining. It's NDC, MPP, NDC. It's not NDC, MPP. Listen to what the minority is saying and take something from it. Because it is our duty to speak for the silent ma majority and to raise the issue so that others will pick it up. But often when it's picked up, it's like Labour is not concerned about it. So oh, these politicians, forget about them. When they wreck the economy, you will not forget about them. You will be affected by the destruction of the economy. And so let's put our agitation and our sentinel duties wider than just our negotiating for our professional groups. We must look at the wider picture about governance issues, about how the economy is managed, issues to do with rule of law, rights of the people, when journalists are oppressed, people's uh, freedom of expression is affected. It is the duty of unions and organized labor to speak out. GBA spoke about perception. Well, what's the reality? Does GBA go to sleep when MPP is in power and wakes up when NDC comes? We'll see. In 2025, we'll see whether you wake up. But it's true, you know yourselves, that is true. That when MPP is in power, they do the most outrageous things and you, you are quiet. And yet when NDC is in power, the least, you know, mistake, and GBA has issued a press release. It's, it's true, you know it's true. And so, the point is, the truth is one. And the truth is the same under Rawlings, it is the same under Kofo. It is the same under Mills, it is the same under Jomama, it is the same under Kufado. The truth does not change. And so if you are concerned with people's rights, you are concerned with protecting uh, uh, human rights and freedoms, you must be consistent under any administration. Not only be act, uh, concerned under some administrations and not under other administrations. There was a time under an NDC administration there was a time under the one administration, an NDC administration, GBA said that they had stopped uh, at all the uh, political dissent, that they wanted to concentrate on their core mandate of professional training and turning out good lawyers and so on and so forth. I mean, <laughs> since when did that happen? GBA is a professional body that has been involved in political activism and human rights protection. Over the years, you were a leading member of the professional groups that were in the People's Movement for Freedom and Justice from then. And so what has changed? And so it's a question for you yourselves to answer. Uh, free SHS. How do you improve free SHS? How do you improve it without reviewing it? What do you want to improve? You don't sit down and review the implementation and see where you've gone wrong before you can improve it. Okay, so you write what you want us to improve. And how do we improve it? If we don't bring all the stakeholders together. And I'm saying, let's bring the parents, let's bring you the teachers, let's bring the headmasters, chas, let's bring educational experts, and look at the operation of the free SHS over the last how many years it has, it has happened. And see where the bottlenecks are. And let all of us agree that this is how we want the improvements to happen. Is that rocket science? It's not rocket science. A meeting of all of us to come and sit and decide how to improve uh, free SHS, and that becomes an issue. For instance, look at feeding. The current system in free SHS feeding is outrageous. You centralize the feeding. And so buffer stock has to get suppliers, get the food, dispatch it to the headmasters, and you go and the quality of the food is poor. When the headmasters and the bezers were in charge of feeding, the children ate better quality food. And so we are saying, let's decentralize the feeding, let's give it back to the headmasters and the bezers. The money you are giving to uh, uh, buffer stock, give it as a feeding grant to the secondary schools and let them procure their own food, hire their own food contractors.
but I cannot impose that. We need to sit and see why the current feeding system is not working and why the quality of the food is poor. And when we have done that, we'll say the former system was a better system. And we all will decide that let's decentralize the feeding system again and let the schools procure the food for the children. And let the government pay the money to the schools as feeding grants to continue to feed the children. But before we are able to take those decisions, let's all come together and sit. And, and, and it's not only the, the feeding, there are other parts of free SHS we would want to improve. For instance, how come we've ended up with all this confusion uh, uh, with uh, how many children going at this time, others come at this time, uh, what do they call that thing? What is it? Double track, double track. Double track. So it's not only feeding, there's also double track. And the teachers are overworked. Before when we had a trimester system, the teachers used to have a break to be able to mark their papers, take a rest, write their curriculum for the next term before the children come and then they start teaching. Now the teachers have no break. When these ones are going, these ones are coming, these ones are coming, these ones are going. Now it's basa. You don't know who goes where, when and who goes where. And so if I say teachers come, headmasters come, parents come, educational experts come, GES come, all of you come and sit and let's see how to resolve these problems. Is that a problem? Does that mean cancellation? And so cut out, let's cut out the politics. And the whole Minister of Education, Minister of Education, a professor, says that he does not understand review and that in his mind review means cancel. I mean, sometimes, yes, it's politics, but sometimes we must be truthful. Because as you are playing politics with the lives of these children, it is affecting their lives. Today, you, university teachers, I've spoken to many of you, you are concerned about the quality that is coming from the senior high schools. Many of you are concerned, and you quietly tell us that is sometimes it's very difficult. Even some students find it very difficult to write even a paragraph. And you all know these things, but if you say it, they'll come after you, so you're all quiet. So I'm saying that one of the things this election is going to do, 24th, uh, uh, 7th December 2024, if NDC comes, is a new Independence Day for people in the educational sector. You hear the things they will say. After 7th January, the headmaster we couldn't call here to come and speak for headmasters, he will be freed. His chains should have been removed. He can speak freely. And you hear the things they will say. So for now, hold your peace. I know if you talk, they will transfer you to Bunkurgu or to Bole or somewhere. And so we'll just leave it there. Um, all the other things I will... I'm particularly concerned about the technical universities because this was a baby that we, you know, produced. And so I've taken down all he said and we'll look at it. Um, there's something to do also with they are upgrading themselves in terms of going for training and all that. I've, I heard it in other places. So all that the technical university teachers have said, we have taken notes of them. Um, there are other things. Um, the Ghana Medical Association uh, talked about the abandoned hospitals. We, we did that program for not only Ashanti, but for other uh, regions. We said that every region must have a teaching hospital, a regional hospital and a teaching hospital. And that's why we started work on the Bogatanga Regional Hospital. We did the Upper West Regional Hospital. We expanded the Tamale Teaching uh, Hospital. And um, we worked on several other hospitals. Aside from that, we also said we should establish additional hospitals in Ashanti and Accra, mainly because of population. The population in those two regions is growing the fastest. 
and we've had in Accra the Kolebu Teaching Hospital since God got in Gagisbeck's time and we've had the Confanoche Teaching Hospital you know for God knows how long now we realize that there was too much pressure on these hospitals and they are teaching hospitals and so they are tertiary hospitals they are not the first port of call for somebody who has malaria and other things these are hospitals that are supposed to receive that are that have specialists that are supposed to receive cases that smaller lower hospitals cannot handle and so for Ashanti we said let's build the Sewa hospital as a regional hospital so that that will be the first point of call for people who have normal sicknesses, typhoid, malaria, uh, dysentery, and things like that, so that it will cut those people off Confanoche. And then we also said it's time to have a second military hospital because the military hospitals don't go on strike, and they are accident and emergency centers, and apart from that, they also are there in times of crisis. And so we said it's time to have a second military hospital, and so it was decided that it should be in uh, Ashanti, and that's Afari. In order that more pressure can be taken off Confuanoche. When I was leaving office, I think Afari military hospital was more than 80% complete. When I was leaving office, Sevilla was at an advanced stage, about 70% complete. And so one would have thought that at this time that we are speaking, those hospitals would have been completed. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened. And I thought that government would have put its attention on finishing the existing hospitals because we have Kumau, we have uh, Formina, we have uh, Tepa. Okay, Tepa has been finished and commissioned. We have uh, Abetifi. We have, um, uh, se there are several of them, Bekwai, and so many others. So one thought that government would have concentrated and finished those hospitals, and then probably not start 111 hospitals, because you can't finish them. You can start with 50 hospitals, knowing that the resources you have can finish and equip them so that they become operational. But if you say you are doing 111 hospitals, most of those hospitals are going to be left to me to come and complete because I'll win the election of 2024. And I've made a pledge that we will continue the abandoned projects of previous governments. And so it means it includes the projects that are started by the Akufuado government that are not completed and I've said that instead of us rushing to do new projects, let's conserve the money we have and use it to finish the abandoned and uncompleted projects. <laughs> waivers for vehicles. The waivers for vehicles was cancelled because it was being abused. People used to use their waiver and give it to somebody else. They import the car, they know it's not for them, they take a percentage from the person, and then the person gets the waiver. If we can find a way of guaranteeing that the actual beneficiary is the user of the vehicle, I think that it clears a way for us to look at a reintroduction of the vehicle waivers. And so that's something we should look at. Um, there were so many other things. NHIS is a shadow of itself. It was introduced by President Kufo, uh, the Mutual Insurance Fund, and then Professor Mills came and made it a national fund. Before Professor Mills came, if you had an NHS card, you could get service only in your district. Professor Mills came and made it a national fund, and so if you had a card, you could get treatment anywhere in the country. Unfortunately, it came under what they call the capping and realignment law. When the new government came into office, they capped all funds. And so when a fund increases to a certain amount, all the excess amount goes into the consolidated fund. And aside from that, the rate of release of the NHIS is very slow. And so the facilities provide the service, but they don't get a refund of their claims. And so most of the facilities are reluctant to accept uh, NHIS card holders. If you go to some of the private hospitals and then 
they ask you, it says, are you paying cash or you're paying uh, your, your card holder? If you say NHIS, they say, oh, and then they share NHIS for and uh, your private, we are looking after our private people, so go to another hospital. And even the public hospitals, I was, somebody told me that there was a practice where when you go, they ask whether you're paying cash or you're paying card. If you say you're paying card, they say sit here. We become apartheid in South Africa. If you are paying cash, sit here. Then they'll start calling the cash people. And the doctor will see them and give them whatever treatment they have to. Then after that, NHIS, yes, number one, bruh. You know, in our own country. And so, one, to take away the capping and realignment of the NHIS so that the full amount of the funds flow into the NHIS. And then two, to make sure that the payments and the transfer to the National Health Insurance Authority are as frequent as possible. Um, there are so many other things I, I just uh, cannot uh, cover all of them. But I just want to assure you that we have taken cognition of everything you said. I wrote some notes myself, but Beatrice has the full uh, report of everything that you did. Some of your colleagues in other places have said the same thing. And so when we go, we're going to synthesize everything and then see where it is the same. The ones that are the most important, we'll extract from there and then we'll put into our manifesto. So I want to thank you all very much for this session. May God richly bless you and thank you once again.